Welcome back. Welcome back. Well, there's news this week, latest news of Georgia. It's more than a month now that's passed since Georgia first moved to retake the breakaway region of South Ossetia, sparking the Russia-Georgia war that raged throughout August. The conflict now appears, appears to be drawing to a close as a French brokered ceasefire uh, ensures a Russian retreat from Georgian territory, or does it? But this is no return anyway to the pre-war situation. More than 7,000 Russian troops will remain in Abkhazia and South Ossetia, and the Kremlin refuses to revoke its recognition of the sovereignty of both Abkhazia and South Ossetia. My guest today is an expert on the region. Donald McLaren was the British ambassador to Georgia until last year, and he could tell us exactly what went wrong in South Ossetia and about the long-term implications of the crisis in the Caucasus. And he's also, I'm delighted to see, wearing red socks. <laughs> Matching socks. Matching socks. A, a tribute to the Kremlin, surely. Um, absolutely. <laughs> it implies that you're biased in favour of Russia <laughs> in this particular situation. Um, why, what did the Russians really want to achieve when they went into Georgia? It's part of a long-term policy. Uh, relations between Russia and Georgia have been bad, certainly in recent years, but there's a very long history. Brought to a head by the appearance of Saakashvili, a reformist, democratic, outward-looking, indeed westward-looking leader of Georgia, you would have thought there'd be a win-win situation there for Georgia and Russia. Uh, Saakashvili made it quite clear just a year and a half ago that of all the countries he has relations with, the key relationship should be with Russia, family reasons, cultural ties, historical connections, and modern politics and commerce. He said, I want to have a civilized relationship with Russia, but Russia must get off my back. I'm running a sovereign country, and I should, and my countrymen should be free to make their own choices. The Russians clearly don't like the idea of a country as close as that, looking westwards, looking to join Western institutions, and they don't like Saakashvili, the reformer, running his own country. So we've got a clash of history, we've got a clash of personalities, Saakashvili, Putin, and the continuing existence of two separatist enclaves, Abkhazia and South Ossetia. For Russians, a golden opportunity to keep two very long thorns in Saakashvili's flesh. And so this particular crisis was was triggered in a way by Georgian taking the, taking the first move in a way, wasn't it? I think we have to see exactly. Well, it depends where you start. I ex suppose. Well, exactly. Um, as far as the immediate hostilities, the the events leading up to the seventh of August, what is very interesting is that the Georgians have called for an international investigation. Uh, now, I think that's interesting because it's not exactly the steps that would be taken by. Uh, the guilty party. But until we have a very clear objective analysis uh, and indeed interviews with people on all sides, um, we won't know very clearly who did what first. But just taking it back a little bit, the Russians have, since the collapse of the Soviet Union, recognized Georgia's sovereignty and territorial integrity. There's been no doubt about that. So although Abkhazia and South Ossetia have been asking for independence. As far as the international community is concerned, including Russia, Georgia is one whole sovereign country. Now, Saakashvili, uh, unlike his predecessors, made it clear to the separatists that they should not just be part of Georgia, but be part of Georgia's life. He offered them uh, autonomy and representation at the highest levels of government. Great plan, but no good if the other side don't want to talk uh, or if they still hold out for the idea of being separate from Georgia, either independent or part of the Russian Federation. And unfortunately, the Russians did nothing to help take those plans forward so that the Abkhaz and the South Ossetians, still within Georgia's territorial boundaries, that they would be able to take advantage of the autonomy offers made by Saakashvili. If the Russians had done that, we might be in a different situation today. And where from here? Does this week's Sarkozy negotiations uh, suggest progress has really seriously been made or not? 
It's better than nothing. Yeah. Um, uh, remember that I think it was two, maybe three weeks ago, Medvedev said to Sarkozy, oh, yes, don't worry, we're pulling back. We've already started. Uh, we're, we're, we're on our way. Nothing happened. Um, and the Russians, indeed, as far as I know, are still investing Poti, the commercial port on the Black Sea, and also are still in strength in what they call their buffer zones, uh, which is what they call their buffer zones, um, around uh, uh, South Ossetia. And they say they need another month to withdraw to the positions before. There's no limit, as far as I know, on how many Russians uh, should be left behind. If we're going back to the status quo ante 7th of August, it will be a relatively small number, 500 in South Ossetia. But this is an example of how, because of the Russian invasion and occupation, they feel that they are in a position to write the rules of the new game. And that's the challenge for ourselves. How do we cope with this new situation? How do we help Georgia to return to a position where they are able to rebuild and carry on the reformist program, which was gathering a lot of momentum over the last three years? And what is the message in all of this for the people of the Ukraine, for instance? That Russia's on its way? Not necessarily, but I think a lot of Ukrainian eyes, and not just Ukrainian, will be looking to see how the West deals with Russia in the aftermath of this Georgia crisis. There are pressure points all around the rim of uh, Russia and the former Soviet Union. Crimea, you mentioned Ukraine, Crimea is one such. What will be the future of the Russian base at Sevastopol? Um, and also Russian, the Russian political relationship with Ukrainian leaders, both Yushchenko and Timoshenko. There's a lot to play for. But I think the West can help itself by ensuring that the focus is not diluted from the immediate task of getting Russia not just back from, but out of Georgia. Ambassador, thank you very, very much indeed. Thank you. On Wednesday, in a giant tunnel buried 100 metres under the Alps, a group of scientists began the most ambitious scientific experiment of all time, the Large Hadron Collider, or the Big Bang Machine, which you've seen pictures of. It's taken 20 years of preparation, $9 billion, and involved more than 10,000 scientists from 70 different countries. The question now is, is it worth it? Well, to find out, I'm joined today, I'm delighted to say, by Professor John Ellis. He's one of the leading scientists from CERN, that's the European Organization for Nuclear Research, and was there on Wednesday when the machine was turned on. Welcome, John. I gather everything went well, according to plan. Uh, even better than planned. Even it, better? Yeah, it took uh, much less time than we'd expected to uh, get the machine uh, working. So uh, the machine consists of a 27-kilometer tunnel with uh, beams of particles, protons they're called, going in opposite directions. So uh, in less than an hour, we got the protons going around in one direction, and so then we got the protons going around in the other direction, and uh, now the, the beams are being tuned up so that we can do some collisions uh, probably in 10 days or a couple of weeks' time. And, and what will happen in the collision? Will there be noise or sound or silence or what? Uh, no noise because these collisions take place in vacuum. We have a, a vacuum which mm. is uh, even better than that in outer space. Uh, so these collisions take place in, in a tube which is actually surrounded by magnets. Uh, those magnets are actually colder than outer space. Uh, so you, you don't hear anything. Well, of course, there's experimental apparatus around that's got electronics and, and that makes a bit of a noise. But the, the actual collisions themselves are inaudible. And what, when you do it, and, and the collisions take place, what will it teach us? What will it, what's the purpose of it? You can think of the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider, as being a fantastic microscope, something like ten times more powerful than any microscope that humanity's ever built before. Uh, we can look inside the structure of matter, the sort of stuff that you and I and the planet uh, is made of, uh, we can look inside it and figure out what it's made of, what the fundamental constituents are, and what holds it together. So that's absolute basic knowledge, and, and that will tell us also how the, how the world was created in the first place? The Big well, Bang Theory? Well, it, it'll give us insights into how the, the Big Bang evolved. We, we, we can't actually go back to time equal to zero and figure out what happened right, right at the beginning. But uh, we can get back uh, and recreate conditions 
that uh, held within one trillionth of a second of the beginning of the Big Bang. And in terms of you were talking about the no, we were talking about the knowledge we might obtain uh, from this whole experiment. How will it affect people's lives, if at all, in 20 years' time? Quite frankly, we don't know. Uh, it's difficult to say what a discovery could be used for if you haven't yet made the discovery. <laughs> uh, what, what we can well, say... Well, you must be pretty confident you're going to find something that justifies the expenditure of $9 billion, presumably. Well, what we're basically doing is continuing the, the human quest for, for understanding the, the world, the universe around us, that's been going on for, for thousands of years. Uh, certainly the ancient Greeks, probably before then, people were asking sel themselves the question, what's the universe made of? How does it work? And of course, every time that people have advanced in that knowledge, it's been useful for something. Just to give you a couple of examples, uh, in the early 20th century, uh, people understood uh, quantum physics, uh, the way that atoms work, and Einstein uh, discovered relativity, uh, how gravity works. And Initially, people thought, well, well that's all very abstruse and, and useless, but in fact, uh, quantum physics, the theory of the atom, underlies all the modern electronics industry that we're using now to communicate around the world. And uh, your sat-nav system, uh, your GPS system in your car, that needs relativity in order to interpret the signals coming from the satellites in space. So every discovery that we've made has turned out to be useful for something. But we don't know how, so at the moment you can't yet say definitively that it's value for money. Definitively. I think we can say that we, we've been, quote unquote, value for money up until now. Let, let me give you perhaps the most famous example of a spin-off from the work that we've done at CERN. Uh, around 1990, uh, a scientist at CERN, Tim Berners-Lee, invented the World Wide Web. And the purpose of this was to enable scientists, the thousands of scientists from around the world, to collaborate on our experiments, to communicate with each other and share their data. This is, if you like, the first online community. Uh, and of course, the World Wide Web has uh, revolutionized society in general. I don't know how many trillions of dollars it's contributed to the world uh, GNP. So I think that's value for money. Mm. But, but th these answers th th are going to take some time to come. Uh, now we're in a period where we're tuning up the machine, probably be a few weeks before we get the first collisions. Uh, next year, for the first time, we'll be getting collisions at the top energy at a decent rate, probably another two or three years before we can tell you and, and your viewers whether the Higgs boson exists. And so that's, uh, well, that's absolutely fascinating. But does the fact that things have gone quite well so far, does it, has it removed the risk that, that a great hole, black hole will be created and the whole of humanity sucked away? <laughs> This black hole business is, is just sheer nonsense. Is it? Okay? You can't find any serious physicist who, who really believes that uh, the LHC could produce a black hole that would devour the Earth. It might produce a black hole. If it does, surely it's going to decay extremely quickly because it would be absolutely infinitesimal. It's worth mm. remembering that when we collide these particles, these protons, they carry about as much energy as a mosquito. Uh, so, no, not big enough to devour the Earth, and they would decay any black holes before they uh, could devour the Earth. John, you're terrific at talking about all of this. I've never heard anyone on this subject talk so clearly about it. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And we'll end today's program with that good news. There aren't going to be any black holes, and we're not all going to be sucked into oblivion. Isn't that a nice way to end a program? Bye-bye for now.